So let's talk about the climate revolution. Uh, you're right in the thick of it, having been in a number of revolutions before. Uh, timing's everything. You announced today uh, that you closed on $7.3 billion. Uh, this is a fund that you and I talked about with Hank Paulson about a year ago. It was, it was an, a good idea that you were taking to market. $7.3 billion later, you hit the hard cap. Wow, that's a lot of money. What happened in that intervening year in terms of the demand, which is clearly robust? So I think capital has finally woken up to figure out it needs to play an active role in the ecosystem. So this, uh, this conference has been great because I look at it, there's an emerging ecosystem around this effort from government to entrepreneurs to scientists. And for the, that ecosystem really to work, there literally needs to be tens of trillions of dollars deployed. Trillions with a T. Trillions with a T. Uh, and somehow, the markets were a little bit behind that. There, mm. there wasn't, uh, there were 194 funds greater than a billion dollars investing in technology when we started raising this money. And there were two or three bigger than a billion focused on private equity and climate. So that, that disproportionate shift had to change. And what we found when we went to market is very different than a couple of years ago. The major pools of capital around the world have this front and center on their desk. Yeah. I was talking to the CEOs and CIOs of sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, et cetera. And a couple of years ago, they would have said, go talk to our sustainability person over there. We think it's a great idea. Go talk to them. This time, it was front and center on their desk. So we have 51 of the largest institutions in the world investing behind this. The second thing that happened is we actually have 28 of the largest corporations in the world, together over a trillion seven in revenues, who joined us. This mm. is very atypical. Joined us as investors in this fund because they know they need to advance what's happening in this ecosystem in order to meet their goals. So what we found is actually a, a much more robust set of demand to deploy capital. But people have really moved from, they know they need to, the question is how. Right. And so what we were giving them was an institutional quality, globally deployed way to begin to answer that question of how we're gonna participate in this change. All right, we're gonna to get to the how in, in a second and, and get down to brass tacks of sort of where you're investing and, and what some of these investments look like and the, and the challenges and difficulties of that. But I wanna pick up on something you said, and you and I have talked for many years about private equity. And, and talked a lot about the private markets versus the public markets. It seems that the public markets have at least optically sort of embraced this more than the private markets. Break that down for the sort of public versus private opportunity here. I think the public markets woke up a couple of years ago and, and realized they needed to get involved. But what happened was um, a moment not unlike 2000 in the tech revolution. If you remember back in 2000, there was a sudden like boom of capital into the tech marketplace, but there weren't enough tech companies really ready to take it. And as a result, the market shot up and went down. That was considered a bubble, but if you think about it, it was after that moment that Google, Facebook, you know, the, the big tech companies were built. And so I feel like um, the tech market or the, the climate market today has been focused on two sectors, the grid and EVs. Mm. So about 90% of the market value related to climate in the public market are in those two sectors. That's only about 36% of emissions. Interesting. So behind those first to move sectors, the grid and EVs, there's hydrogen, there's carbon credits, there's materials of all sorts. And the private market is really a place that we can begin to create the climate companies of tomorrow, which eventually will land in the public market, but have a ways to travel yet. So one of the things that you know better than anyone is that private markets also come with risk. You know, there's, there are uh, chances you need to take. It's different sort of diligence. They're earlier stage and in some cases. Walk us through what the process of actually investing looks like and and put it in the context if you will of your history of investing that you know goes all the way back to the bass family in in the late 90s we won't go down you know memory lane too much but but i do wonder you know what are the analogs you look at in terms of framing this opportunity 
Yeah, I have a 30-year-plus career investing in private markets, and uh, it's important to get yourself in the right neighborhood. So you want to get in the way of big waves, the interest rate cycle wave, the globalization wave, the tech wave. And after watching the tech wave play out, I really made a promise to myself that if I saw another wave of that, of that size, that I would be all in and trying to make a difference. And, and that really brings you to uh, this moment. Um, the issue is this is both attractive investing, something that we all want to make a difference on, but it's also very hard investing. We've been trained for the last 20 years to live at the speed and characteristics of tech investing. Frankly, if you come up with a tech company, someone has already built the internet for you. Right. It's very easy to do A-B testing and code is cheap. You look at climate, we're dealing with physical investing. Time frames are longer, dollars are just much, much more. And the science of it moves from computer science to chemistry. And that type of investing, in some ways, you and I were talking about this, it, it, feels like biotech investing sometimes. Mm. You have to spend literally hundreds of millions of dollars before you know for sure it'll work. Uh, and you have to be prepared for the time frames and capital involved in physical investing. So that notion of you know moving from computer science to chemistry, I would imagine also affects who you field for your team, as it were. Um, you know, obviously you guys, you, TPG, have a lot of sector expertise, but this feels different. Um, feels like a different combination of people, a different background. How do you go about sort of building the group that, that is going to go after these deals? Uh, you know, it's for me, building a great investment team is like casting a great dinner party. You want to bring together people who have the same values and are interested in the same things, but maybe come from different backgrounds. So if you look at our climate investment team, we put together pieces of it from our industrial team. We brought in a renewable specialist from outside. We have software people focused on grid management. And we have operating personnel who are familiar with what it takes to build physical assets. So we had to take pieces of 30 plus years of experience and add in some additional special sauce. Uh, the effort that we put together really hasn't existed before. Mm. There is um, extraordinary expertise across renewables and uh, fossil fuels, but this is a, a new ecosystems coming together, and it's it's taking a little bit of a of a new mix of people. Hmm. And are you finding those people in in different places? I mean, for a long time, I or I feel like there was an evolution in, in private equity from just going, you know, to like, all right, top business schools. We know who those people are. We're going to get them in. We're going to do it. You guys were among the firms that were a little bit more creative in, in where you found people. Is it in companies? Is it in universities? Like, where are you sourcing? Yes. Yeah. It's in companies, it's universities. It's, it's, um, the one thing I can say, Jason, is um, I have never seen as much human capital interest hmm. in a type of investing as we're seeing in this. So, you know, Why do you think that is? Um, you know, I, I think uh, in society and in companies, there's a little bit of what I'll call the hourglass problem, which is people at the top get it. You see CEOs really stepping forward on that. And uh, new entrants to the workforce get it. It's the middle. People are having to change how they do things. They're, in some cases, struggling with the amount of change and the speed of change that needs to happen. As we bring people into our organization, they know their personal carbon footprint. They have been focused on this for a long period of time, mm. and they get that this is not only this is two sides of a coin. This is an immense existential risk, but it's also a career opportunity. Well, I know that this is a thread that's been pulled through, throughout the day here, and and it's a, an issue that so many people who are in this room with us and also watching uh, can attest to. This is an issue, as you say, it's existential. There are movies made uh, about this, uh, some satirical, some not so much. Um, there's a lot of like, ha, huh, ooh, um, that's going on around this issue. It's also a political hot potato. You have people taking very strong sides on it. How do you, in that environment, sort of separate the signal from the noise, as it were, given the sort of political fraughtness, 
I don't think fraughtness is a word, but I just used it, and um, that, that surrounds this issue. Uh, I think, first of all, you made me king. I'd put a price on carbon. I'd have full disclosure. There's a lot of things that we should and can do. But uh, I'm a practitioner, so our job is authenticity and action. Mm -hmm. Every molecule we get out done the right way is a step in the right direction. So in part, my answer is the noise will continue. Hopefully, society will get these decisions right, but we can't slow down for that. We need to act now, and we need to bring the power of capital innovation together. We as capital need to join this ecosystem and do our part. And if we wait for perfect disclosure, if we wait for perfect rules, you know, it's interesting, in the tech world, people just went and did things and waited up for regulation to catch up later. Uh, here, I think sometimes there's been a tendency to kind of wait for governments to act. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, if we learned anything in COVID, it's efforts like the vaccine effort work. And so if we get to work and put our mind to it, I, I'm optimistic we'll make progress. On that point, just to push you a little bit, you know, there was also, taking the cynical journalist view of, of the world, I felt like we went through a moment during COVID where there's a certain segment of the population that doesn't trust science, doesn't believe science. How do you make that case that this is real, this is scientifically proven, this is chemistry, all of these things? What can you do from where you sit as a business person, as an investor, to sort of help make the case to the broader world? I want you to save the world, Jim. Like, why are you going to do it? Uh, there's people in this room that all together can, can make progress in that. Again, um, uh, certainty in your convictions. So that's authenticity. I, don't, I think we need to stop arguing this and we need to do. So there will be people who will not agree along the way. And it's not my job to do anything other than to show them how to move forward as best we can. Right. And uh, so I think, um, you know, one of the things about this area and uh, it's an awesome conference. There are hundreds of conferences the rest of this year about this. So we're, you know, we're coming together around this issue, but we need to do everything we can to move beyond the debate of what and why mm -hmm. and just focus on how. And that's where we're putting our effort. All right. So tell me a story. Tell me, tell me something cool in your portfolio that you've discovered um, that might be interesting to this group, because part of what I find at least fascinating about what you're doing is that you are, you know, going to places where that aren't obvious and aren't represented, as we said earlier, in the public markets. You're talking um, to researchers and practitioners. Like, what's one thing, especially in the last year, that that you've been surprised by in terms of a technology or in terms of a possibility around something? Which of my children? The um, uh, first of all, uh, I am just staggered by the amount of innovation activity going on. We've made 15 investments, maybe $3 billion since the beginning of, of eight, 18 months ago, 16 months ago, across all different areas. You're going to hear from Kyle Clark in about 30 minutes here. Uh, you heard earlier that we can't do electric airplanes. Actually, we're learning we can for certain types of missions, and, and Kyle will tell you about that. You know, we know how awful, awful methane is. You know, you can capture methane and turn it into renewable natural gas. Uh, we thought hydrogen was years away. There's projects we're seeing, multi-billion dollar projects, 43 giga projects for hydrogen around the world that are forming up in anticipation of what can be done with hydrogen. So uh, I think there's a sense of can do happening in the market. Um, to be clear, it's got a long way to go in some cases. But um, um, I, I think the coolness is the action. Yeah. It, as we sort of wind down a little bit, I'm going to I'm going to turn back the clock if I can, because if you didn't see the terrifically moderated interview that we did about a year ago with you and Hank Paulson, um, it was interesting because it was a it was a catalytic moment. I for me, at least in in observing the two of you, I mean, these are two people who were obviously incredibly accomplished making a pretty hard pivot to something that both of you have long cared about and been public about, but sort of pushing all your chips, as it were, you know, for this part of your career into this. 
What have you learned? Like what's been eye-opening to you as someone who's been an investor, as you say, for 30 years, you've taken massive com public companies private, you have pursued a growth strategy, you've invested in everything from Uber to Puck. Um, Puck News, which is a great news service, but by the way, I was talking to Jim about my subscription earlier. Um, but what, what's been surprising to you? Uh, what's been surprising to me is um, that the power of specialized capital and focus is playing out here even more than I expected. And let me explain that. Um, I live in the Silicon Valley area, and people, tourists are always coming looking for Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is not one thing. It's this ecosystem we're talking about today. But one of the things that made Silicon Valley Silicon Valley was Sand Hill Road. There were a series of people who were deploying capital, helping to sort out which companies were really going to make it work, and accelerating those companies with knowledge and capital. And um, I, that was a really important part of the tech revolution. I think gathering capital, having it be knowledgeable, and bringing that to this ecosystem is working better than I expected. Mm. The activity levels are well beyond what I would have projected you know, a year into um, working this fund. Uh, and the second thing is, um, I feel like I live in two worlds. When I, I read in the media all the things that aren't happening, uh, I get sort of uh, semi-depressed and suicidal. And then I get into the entrepreneurs who are walking into our firm and all the things that are happening uh, is really is really, I think, um, a surprise. Mm -hmm. Because if sometimes if you aren't in this room or you aren't with those entrepreneurs, you may be missing just how much is happening. So project out a year, two year, five years, like what are the conversations that we may be having in a room like this about investing in climate? Where will we be, like crystal ball it a little bit? Yeah, I think um, we're going to be talking a lot about the battery wars. Like uh, I know you had um, QuantumScape here earlier today, a great company. Uh, but uh, there is, on paper, more battery supply than demand coming in the next few years. Like, So how is that going to work out? Is it going to be like the disk drive wars uh, mm -hmm. were in, in, uh, in tech? I, you know, how the battery market, which is so critical, works out. You know, How are we going to get enough lithium to work it so that the dynamics of markets that we know we are there, but we know are there, but we don't yet see how they're going to sort themselves out. That's going to be fascinating. And then I think we're probably just as in tech, we're going to be talking about things we don't even think we're going to be talking about. What what are we really going to do in the hydrogen economy? Why why aren't we talking more about nuclear? Mm -hmm. right? What are what are some of the things that may work out? Clearly aren't ready to work out today, but um, you know, would you have thought? 10 years ago, actually it was off the charts that 10 years ago that solar, wind, and EVs would be cost, would be better in cost than, than, uh, than, their, um, than what they'd be competing mm -hmm. with. Right? So we're, I think what will be the surprise of five years from now is that we won't be surprised to be having a lot of these conversations. Interesting. And so tell me as we wrap up sort of about the about the appetite on the institutional end, because to sort of finish where we started, you know, you raised seven plus billion dollars for this fund, that indicates both an appetite and an enthusiasm. And as you mentioned, it's corporate, it's presumably pension funds, it's sovereign funds. How do you see that trending in terms of their appetite? Because I have to imagine there are other private equity firms or other private equity firm wannabes who are looking at that number and say, wait, what? Like, there's billions of dollars to be had to, to go invest? How do you see that shaping up from the institutional side? As an early investor in Uber, Airbnb, um, Spotify, I studied two-sided markets a lot. And when I got into this, to this question of could we accelerate this, it had to be a two-sided market. There had to be interest on the investor side and there had to be enough good projects. And there was a fair amount of skepticism after Clean Tech 1.0 as to whether both of those would be true. So um, I think what our efforts to date in fundraising, and by the way, there's other great renewable funds that are being started. There's, there's, so there's a lot of activity going. 
Um, our efforts have proven that the institutions are now ready. Mm. They are looking for credible ways to express this theme and this need in their portfolio. And the other side of the market, uh, when we announced seven billion, people said, oh, is that too much? Um, it's clearly not. So yeah. they're the second side of the market, which is the number of investable opportunities, are also there. So the role of people like myself is to make those two markets meet, to bring the experience of 30 years of investing, the ideas of it, and connect those two pieces of this ecosystem. And uh, I'd, I'd say the early returns, we've got a long way to travel and a lot to prove, but the early returns are that that two-sided marketplace is ready and people like us need to step up and, and bring it together. And there'll be lots of competition, lots more capital raised, and to that I say, great. Well, it's really good to spend some time with you to, to see this sort of coming to fruition. Uh, it's an idea. It was, it was a big pivot. I feel like I'm, I'm watching Jim Coulter. What would, would this be, like 4.0, uh, like in the making? So thank you so much. Thank you, guys.